let's play. Right. Tonight we are going to explore an old problem, the problem of the one and the many. And why it's a problem? Ah, that's easy to explain. But there's another problem, which is going to go through the whole talk, it goes through all philosophy. And that's this one. We are awake, and we see things, and we talk. But while we are awake, and we see things, and seem to be clear about what it is we see, we don't have a clear enough idea of what shapes our vision. And so we fail to grasp how our own expectations limit that vision. That's the real problem. That's the real problem. Let's see if I can make it clear. Basic idea that we're going to explore is that the highest and most profound idea of the nature of reality is that it is one. And along with it is the idea that since it is totally partless, partlessness is its nature, matter of fact, Plotinus argues that its highest reality should really be called the partlessness rather than the one. What goes along with this idea, therefore, of the one, pure one, is that once you understand it, it's obvious. It has to be obvious or you don't understand it. If you understand that it's obvious and it's one, then we can get to this problem. So it may take us a moment. So we're going to assume the Platonic view in this discussion of the nature of reality. The highest reality, therefore, is called the one. And being as being supra perfect it of necessity overflows and turns upon itself and returns. And this is the basic dynamic of all Greek Hellenistic philosophy. Another word for the one is the highest vision you can have of God. And we're going to talk about the difference between the idea of God and the idea of the one in just a short while. So before creation, then, we can talk about the nature of the one or of God, perfect, perfect in all respects. So perfect, therefore, that it overflows, as it were, and turns upon itself and returns to its source. At that moment of its return on its source, there is a recognition. There is a recognition. That recognition is because it returned to its source and therefore there is a wonder and a joy that attends it. Since it recognizes its source, ah, in that recognition it reaches what is sometimes called being, spelt with a capital B. And since its whole thing is a dynamic, there is a vitality to it all. Now, the Greeks, philosophers, put all of that together, sometimes with one idea and sometimes with another. But most often, they call it with the big word, being. Capital B, when it's used in this way. And that means it presupposes within it that there's a vitality to it. There's a recognition of its source. Therefore, by necessity, recognition presupposes intelligence. But 
Therefore, the very nature of reality overflows being so perfect. It has a dynamic that turns it upon itself, sees itself, and in that moment, intelligence, being, and vitality come into existence. So therefore, this realm is called being, intelligence, hyphen, vitality. Or, for short, being. The same process is said to take place. Now this, of course, is a metaphysical creation. In the same way, then, this too overflows, returns to its source. Same dynamic takes place. And that is said to bring into existence soul. And then, once more, soul and body, and therefore, this is the metaphysical creation, as it were, through these five stages here. The one being soul, soul and body, and beyond that, of course, is just matter. Five stages. We want to talk about this, the highest concept of the divine called the one. And in order to talk about that, we want to contrast it with the idea of God. So now we're going to contrast this idea of the one and God. And why, in the game of philosophy, there's always the choice of which term to use, and among Platonic philosophers, it's always this. should always be the capital, of course that the one is chosen over the idea of God until the last step is made. So then, let's take a look. Let's consider, what are the associations and images that come to your mind when you hear the word God? Does it entail certain roles and certain actions that fit and are in accordance with that role. Right? Does the idea of God generate naturally a whole set of associations? Images. 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 And on the basis of those images, are you, the individual, required to take on certain roles to do and not to do? Does it also necessarily involve not only roles but actions? And does it also involve the idea that there are special times and locations that are necessarily involved when you talk about God? Like, are there special locations such as churches and temples? Are there special times in which you can then become involved in churches and temples and actions and, and ways of being that you then get involved even more fully in the images and in the associations? And I guess you would say, yes, all of that is true. And each person might have different associations and images, but for the most part, there are a certain number that are shared, and when they're shared, people can recognize one another belonging to the same group. It also involves, does it not, some special relationship between man and God. which therefore some are involved in and some can be excluded from. Now, if God is one, and we just consider the highest term for God to be the one, now, what associations do you have for one? Uh, what images do you have for one? Do certain things and not do certain things because of one? Uh, 
go to church or a temple because of one? Doesn't fit, does it? It doesn't fit. And that's rather curious because we want to add something else. There is no special relationship between the idea of one and you. There's no special relationship. There's no war you have to go for. There's no sacrifice you have to perform to it, for it. But yet, if I can bring you to see how the idea of the one is being used, it has a distinct advantage over the idea of God as an image, as a word, in the pursuit of a higher, more meaningful life. Let's see how we can do it. If I were to say, tell me, as you're going through your daily world, where would you look to see for, see, uh, detect, detect, right? Detect, see, imagine the divine. as God. Is there anything in the everyday world, ah, uh -uh, this truck, that brings you to realize the idea of the divine or God? You say, no, no, I got the wrong thing. I say, oh, a bigger piece? In contrast, let's take a look at this idea of the one. This is the central notion in Platonic philosophy. And basically I'm centering my thought tonight not on Proclus, which I've been doing up to this point, but into a thinker called Plotinus who lived in the third century. And of all the philosophers, if you want to read someone who can write beautifully, I assure you, you'll love Plotinus. And this is what he says when he talks about the one. It is by the one that all beings are beings. Curious. Now his reasoning. For what could exist were it not one? Upon losing its oneness, whatever it is, it loses existence. Well then, this is saying, the first statement is saying about the one. It's the very condition for a thing being what it is, is that it's a one. It's the condition for things being. And uh, what could exist were it not the one? Therefore, it also includes the idea, by heavens, you need this idea in order to talk about existence. Upon losing its oneness, it loses existence. So now we have coming into existence and passing out of existence, the whole idea of life and death, caught within one word, the one. So look here, look around, anything you see, anything you see, anything you distinguish, is a one, this is one. Ah, the top is one. When I call it one, I ignore everything else when I call it one. Right? Uh, ah! Now, how can we account for the fact that whatever we experience is a one? And how do you go further and account for the fact that of all the things you experience, you never experience the one? Let's try it. I'm going to take this great artwork off for a moment, come back to it later, build another one. I want to use these words now. One, oneness, or unity, 
I want to use the idea of whole, all, sum. Now, literally speaking, would you agree, when you look at this, when you look at this in terms of sight, you don't see all of it, you don't see the back of it, and you see the back, then you don't see the other side, etc. Three-dimensional figure, no matter where you look at it, there's a part you don't see. So therefore, in terms of experience, in terms of experience, you only see part and infer the whole. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. But the parts that make this up are not loosely connected. See, when you experience this and look at this, would you agree it's more than just a bunch of parts collected together in a bag, loosely scattered as it were. It has a certain unity. Now, strictly speaking, do you see the unity? Look, suppose one of us were to say, of course you see the unity. I'd say, oh good, 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 good. By the way, when you hear something, is the only thing you ever hear sound? Have you ever heard a word? Or, or do you say, no, 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 I don't hear words, I hear sounds and, I, inf and I, I make certain judgments and infer certain things about the sound and then I come out with a word. Is that right? The only thing you ever hear then is sound. Is the only thing you ever see then color? Is the only thing you ever see color? Well then, do you ever see unity? You infer unity. Ah, look here. You infer the presence of unity. You infer the presence of all. And we said unity is another word for oneness. But yet this is one. Now when I say this is one, am I referring to it as all, whole, oneness, or am I going a step further? and ignoring the fact that this has a particular kind of unity and call it one. Let's see. Could this particular thing go through stages in its existence as it comes into, into existence and finally when it passes out of existence? Would you agree for a certain period of that time it's going to take on this shape? And then we can call it one, can we not? But as it disintegrates, we might still call it one with parts disintegrating. So therefore, that there must be a difference between one and unity. Ah, then you don't see, but you infer one. You don't see, you infer oneness. You don't see, but you infer whole. You can count when you have all of the you can count when you have all the parts, but you may not see all of the parts of the parts unless you turn them all around and remember it and try to piece together your memories. Now, why that? Well then that means, does it not? That you can't reach an I you can't reach you can't reach an idea of the one by experience. You can't reach one by experience, you have to infer it. Now, this is saying that this one that we have to infer, it's by the one, that means it's the condition for whatever is, see? Whatever is a one, including this marker, this tree, you, and me, I'm the one with the beard, right? Each of us can be said to be a one, and it's by the one that each is, by, is, is in fact a one. That's what that's saying. That's how we got our unity, oneness. Oh. 
But wait a minute. That means also for what could exist were it not one. Then, the whole existence of this thing, how it came into existence, same thing with us, right? That's saying there must be an origin which links it into, into emerging into existence. Because upon losing its oneness, it loses existence. Wait a minute, if that's true then, as we look around the room, we can see things at various stages of development, and we can see the presence of the one in everything we see. But I see that, well, as you look around, everything is the one. Good heavens, the condition for things being at all is the one. It couldn't exist were it not for the one. Oh, in the various stages it's in, coming into existence and passing out of existence, still one. Oh, then if you grasp at this idea of the one, hey, wherever you look, you're not separated from it. <laughs> right? It's part and parcel of your experience. You cannot be apart from it. You can't be removed from it. You can't be isolated from it. You can't feel guilty about it. Now, what is this one? Because notice from what this is saying, it also accounts for existence, and that is the many. Now, let's see if we can push this. Um, I tell you what, you know what, I think I'm going to move this about. Um, the way now to try to grasp the nature of this one, which is said then to be the source of existence and condition of existence, and what maintains it as a whole and in each of its parts is the one. Well then, how is it possible that anyone can use it as an object to contemplate, to know, to experience? Well, in philosophy, that's a philosophical path. That's a spiritual discipline. And it's very akin in Hinduism to a jnana yoga. Now, I am taking off from Plotinus's viewpoint. And as I think about it right now, I think that's, that's a rather interesting way to proceed because it's going to involve you and him a nice mystery to begin with. Let's go back to our model. Back to our model. All right? The one. It's also, by the way, sometimes called the good because all things desire it. And they only desire it because they intuit it as good. So sometimes it's called the good in Platonic language. And then Neoplatonic language is often called the one. Right. Then being, as we said before, intelligence, vitality. The third part we said was soul. Soul and body. Now, what he is going to outline, Plotinus, and what I'm going to talk about, is how he tries to, do, to explain how the one can be an object of contemplation and how you can grasp it, see it, experience it. Now, I'll change those words later, but in general, we use those terms. And what he's going to do is to say, you have to become aware of 
successively. So you have to become aware of what we mean by soul. You have to then become aware of what this intelligence is. And through the higher and more profound part of intelligence itself, you then, then reach the higher. One, two, three. That means we have to know what we mean by each of these and how successively we go through each one to reach that final vision, which is a special kind of seeing, which is not really a seeing, but we'll talk about that later. Therefore, he says, here we are. Here we are. Our first task, our first task then, to go on this spiritual journey is that must, we must rise to the, pres, the principle possessed within ourselves. There is some principle within us. There is some principle. And we must reach it, we must grasp it. And if we do that, then we can trust in it, we can be committed to it, we can confide in it, we can be said to be established in it. Look at what do these words mean? Trust means then you, you can feel at ease with it. You're committed to it. It means you see it as an object worthy of pursuit. It can be confided in. That means you have an, a relationship in respect to it. And you can kind of settle yourself in it, which is to establish yourself in it. Now, what is this principle that you can do these things with? Well, I'll get there. Because it's by alert contemplation, the soul may grasp all the intelligent sees. That's where we're going, see? Now, he's going to take out the word being, and I'm just going to use the word intelligence now, because that word I'm using quite a bit, but I could equally use the word being, but use the word intelligence because it has a particular interesting characteristic we need. Okay, let's take a look. Um, I'm now going to see whether, a couple of steps, I can bring you to see why the soul and the function of the soul presupposes intelligence. All right, a couple of steps. All right, number one. Would you agree that each of you came here? Right? You had to get here. Therefore, it's quite obvious that you couldn't have gotten here had you not made a decision. Tell yourself to do it. That is to say, you had to command yourself to do it. That wouldn't get you there alone. Agree? Had to have a plan. Have a plan. Needed some plan. Some strategy. Now, if you have the plan, map, schedule of classes, and you can command yourself to do it, you would not do it unless there's a third element there. And that is you thought it would benefit you. That is to say, you take care for yourself. You're taking care for yourself. You're concerned with yourself. Those things, when taken together, is all that I'm take, talk, stepping back to Plato for a moment. This is what gives uh, people in the classical world evidence for saying there exists something that does that, taken together. It's something in us that does that. A soul. That's what they call soul. It doesn't mean it's eternal. It doesn't mean it goes to heaven or hell. It doesn't mean anything else. It just means that you have the capacity to do these things, and therefore they want to call that soul. All right? That's all. So then, would you agree from this brief description, we can now say that there's a principle in you and you will are willing to use the idea of soul. All right? All right? Took a few minutes, but that was worth it. Okay, all right. Now look here. Suppose you decided that you're interested in knowing more about yourself and you wonder about this capacity that you have to seek for your own benefit and care 
and that you're willing to command yourself to do it if you have a clear plan, strategy. Well, then, obviously, it must follow that if you have a plan and strategy, that you depend upon intelligence. Right, you depend upon intelligence. <coughs> you depend upon it. If we're in intelligence, you couldn't have a plan, you couldn't have a strategy. It presupposes intelligence. That may vary between, per between people, but nonetheless, would you not agree? It presupposes some kind of intelligence you can tap into to make your plan. And to the degree that you are successful in your plans, whatever it is, it gives you more confidence that a well-designed plan, a well-structured plan, a good strategy can reach the kinds of goals that you're most interested in seeking. In that sense, you're putting more and more emphasis and reliance upon and using what we call intelligence. Suppose you wanted to get close to that and really grasp it most intimately. Right? Not just infer its existence. But suppose you could finally find a way to grasp what this thing really is. Would it just be an idea, like in a definition in a dictionary? Would it have some kind of existence? Wait a minute, we said it has some kind of being. So it does have existence, because that's what we mean by being. And we also said it has some vitality. Let me su suggest that with an exclamation point. Right. Well, if it has some being intelligent vitality, wouldn't it be interesting to try to grasp it? Because if you did, then I presume that you'd be able to uh, know what the intelligence knows, see what the intelligence sees if it's possible to experience such a thing. Ah, look here. Good thing we have another page. By making that our concern, by making that our concern, our personal concern, By reflecting on it, that's all I mean by contemplation, by continuously reflecting on this question, what is the source of the strategies I create? Uh, what's the source of the plans I make? Presupposes an intelligence. What is this intelligence? I'm turning it into an internal question, I would say. I'm turning it into an internal question. When you do that, when you do that, from the intelligence must come the word of what its scope is. Must come the word. In other words, by this reflecting, by making yourself available and open to this, there it becomes, within a, a period of time, you get the get an interesting insight into what it is. Right? You get a certain insight into what it is. That's called the word. Okay? Must come the word of what its scope is. Now, when we said a moment ago that if you have a plan and you have a strategy that presupposes something came before it, couldn't have a plan or a strategy unless there was some intelligence, that's its prior then, that came before it. Ah, prior. Oh, if something came before it, upon which it depends for its existence, that's the condition for its existence, ah, that's its content. So. Hmm. If anything comes from it, that's its issue. But most clearly, now here's the part we're going to have to build. What comes from it is both pure and simple. Go back to that in a minute. Now, by continuously reflecting upon this, 
then you're caught up in an, a, a reflective activity. So you're turning upon yourself. You're turning upon yourself because you're not expecting intelligence to be in the kitchen drawer, right? Or in the library. It's got to be some way accessible to you. It's, it has impacted you, therefore it must be akin to you. So, okay, where is it? What's it like? By staying with that question and asking, what is it that's prior to the soul? We said intelligence. Now we can say, wait a minute. Must there be something prior even to intelligence? Does it have a content? Does something come forth from it? In other words, we can ask the same set of questions about it. Hmm. Now, this is where a rather curious word comes in, and uh, it's probably one of the most interesting terms in all of philosophy and why it's there. Thank goodness it's there. But it makes the entire pursuit most human. It's this one. Becoming sensitive to this, becoming sensitive, open, in the sense of receptive, Right? Becoming sensitive, receptive, open to these kind of reflections, being absorbed in it. You then are allowing yourself to become a receptacle. You're then, to the degree that you are involved in this question, you're not going to be involved in other things. Turn off the TV, turn off a lot of things. It's from this heightened heightened reflection about your own intelligence and its source and what's prior to it, that one gets into this rather remarkable word I mentioned, I was going to mention a moment ago, now it's a good time to bring it in. Here it is. It opens up one to a stillness A quietude, and from that, out of that, through that, comes the possibility of this magnificent word, beauty. And let's see if I can make that as obvious as it is. All right. Um, let's take the example of, uh, of knowledge. Huh? Here is someone who has this curious thing called knowledge. Now, it's a special kind of knowledge now. It's a knowledge that is cumulative. It has a degree of depth that requires it to be ordered, organized, reflected upon. Take the example of mathematics, medicine, music, gymnastics. Is it not likely that someone who studied arithmetic and now claims they can know it can then pass on to geometry, all right? And after geometry, algebra, and after algebra, uh, higher forms of algebra, and trig, and calculus, and number theory, right? And so on, transfinite numbers, maybe even get into things of that nature. Would you agree when that person, or someone who knows medicine thoroughly, 
and they look at someone who is willing to enter into a relationship with them and share a diagnosis. That the doctor or the person who knows literally sees through their knowledge as natural as it can be. Right. Like you reach that point even in learning to ride a bicycle, right? At first everything has to be cool have to do everything semi-deliberately and then all of a sudden you don't even think about it and you do it. That is, you, you live and see and breathe through your knowing. So that there can be whole systems here that you know so well, you see through it. It is not, it is not in pieces, it's integrated. Would you agree it's all obvious to the person who knows? It may not be obvious to the person who doesn't know. They may have to do a lot of they may have to do a lot of work to get it to the point where it's obvious. I have things that are obvious to a geometrician are not obvious to someone who doesn't know geometry, but if you go through it, you'll see that certain things about it are obvious. So that this obvious quality is what is the most important thing about it. So therefore, this knowing is obvious. It's non non obtrusive. It's Simple, it's pure. Now, knowing in this way, would you not agree a person might equally be able to say, hey, look here, could you also put in here logic, languages? Is it possible, just go a step further, is it possible we can say theoretically, just theoretically, there might be, there might be at some point, someone who can master many, many languages, logic, ma mathematics, medicine, all of these things. So that in one sense, all knowledge would be obvious to them and they would then see it naturally and be able to apply it simply, purely. And wouldn't you agree when they were doing that, they had to, they had to go through a most delicious period. At some point in their experience, there had to be pieces that they didn't see how they could connect them. And then they must have gained an insight into its connection, and therefore they could treat it as a unity. Now, what would then be the most interesting insight to gain in mathematics, medicine, music? Right? We could talk about it. All right, we could talk about it. Now, does insight admit of degrees? Yes. If you are now taking this idea that we're developing, where you're reflecting upon yourself and looking for the source of your own intelligence, you're getting in a clear state, you're sensitive, open, and receptive, it's a heightened reflection, there's a stillness and a quietude, then there's the possibility of this thing called insight. An insight that is obvious as it is insightful. At that moment, at that moment, what you gain an insight into is going to be called intelligence. Well, what is the insight that's so obvious, that's described in terms of intelligence. It's described as radiance, luminosity. It's described as the most brilliant light of being. Its effect, its effect on the person, its effect on the person is bliss. It can be described as the most magnificent experience of beauty itself.
That's what it's like to experience the nature of the intelligence itself. Let's see if we can make sense of it. How could such an experience be related to these three terms? Being, intelligence, vitality. Well, because in that uh, moment of divine luminosity, one recognizes that one, what, what one has experienced is no different than one's own intelligence. And that has, that has a higher sense of existence than anything else. Therefore, it deserves a better word than existence, so we give it the word being. It's not this kind of light. It has a total vitality within itself, undiminished anywhere in the experience. It is total, uncompromising, without variations, and therefore it can be described as being intelligence and vitality. Its effect on us is beauty itself. It can be experienced experientially as brilliant, brilliant, luminosity, Radiance, the most brilliant light of being. Any one of these words are good. Mix them all together, you get the same thing. What's it like? Uh, um, that's why they use the word bliss. Uh, no higher state can be, as, can be considered, no higher state of mind can be considered than this. In it, no one can conceive of anything greater. Now look here, how does this relate back to the one? You see, it's through this experience that we're now calling intelligence, it's through this experience that we're calling intelligence, it's through this that one now must reach for the nature of the one. <coughs> That's not ultimate. That's an ultimate experience, but it's not an ultimate state. Now, an experience, just to make clear about that, an experience has a beginning. It has a content, whatever it is, and it terminates. That's an experience. Whatever it is, if it has a beginning, has a content, has a termination, that's an experience. And if you can then reflect upon it as different than what came before and after, that's an experience. Therefore, this is the highest kind of experience open to man. The reflection is an experience, or if you can reflect on it, then you can yeah. see it. Okay. That's right, the latter. If you okay. can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, here's the tension. In the game of philosophy, this curious game of philosophy, people who reach this point don't go any further. They say, that's it. And it is it. It's great. But it's not this. Why isn't it the one? Because you can make these distinctions within it. Just as we did, remember? We said, by heavens. It has more existence, more kind of existence, higher, more profound existence than anything I know that exists. Oh, being, yeah, 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 a being. Hey, uh, like mine, like my intelligence? Yeah, like your intelligence, another distinction. Hey, does it have vitality? Yeah, that's three in one oil, isn't it? Then that ain't no one. If it's a pure one, it can't be a unity. Therefore, this is a oneness. This is a unity. <laughs> But it's not the one. By the way, when this occurs sometimes to people, it's extremely disillusioning. And rightfully, would you not agree? I mean, you get in one of these experiences, and someone comes up to you and says, uh, uh, was that pretty good? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a beginning and end? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, able to make these dist distinctions? Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess it's a unity. Yeah. Well, it's not the one, is it? 
Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, there's something higher than this? How can there be anything higher than something that that's the highest, most perfect experience? That's not an experience. Got to go beyond that. Go beyond it? I had to work so hard to get there. <laughs> you got to go beyond? This is unfair. And so they file a complaint in the Philosopher's Club. So now we go back to a statement about the nature of the one. All right, now this is a quote from Plotinus. The one is absent from nothing and from everything. It is present only to those who are prepared for it and are able to receive it, to enter into harmony with it, to grasp and to touch it by virtue of their likeness to it, by virtue of that inner power similar to and stemming from the one when it is in that state in which it was when it originated from the one. Look here. The one therefore is present. It's not absent from anything. It's present to everything and yet it's not in another sense. It's present. However, it's present only to those who are prepared for it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That raises a question and how are you prepared for it? Uh -oh able to receive it, enter into the harmony with it, to grasp and to touch it by virtue of their likeness to it. <coughs> Wait a minute, what does that mean? It means then that there's a new kind of yoga that we have to reach for. What is it? It's present only to those who are prepared for it, okay? How do you do that? And if you're prepared for it, I presume then you should be able to receive it. It's either the same or different. Let's consider it different for the moment. That'll give us more numbers and that'll look more profound. All right. It's present only to those who are able to enter into harmony with it. Ah. To grasp and to touch it by virtue of their likeness to it. So they have to be able to enter into harmony with it, to grasp and to touch it by virtue of their... Wait a minute, that means you have to become like the one. Hmm. And by virtue of that inner power, similar to and stemming from the one, when it's in that state in which it was when it originated from the one. I now look here, one, two, three, four. Uh, The method, this is really what's great about philosophy. It's cheap. Right? It's cheap. It's cheap and it's simple. And that's what makes it interesting. The way Plotinus proceeds is to say just one thing. Likeness. You become like the one then it'll take care of itself. Then, hey, then you're prepared for it. Then you're able to receive it. Then you'll enter into harmony with it. And you'll grasp and touch it by that virtue of that very likeness. Therefore, the whole problem of a yoga here is simply to become like it through likeness. The principal idea of all Hellenic philosophy. One word, likeness. In the creation of the universe, in the creation of the universe, I should remind you that Plato in the Timaea says that the Demiorgos had the idea of the entire creation in mind. And the idea that he had, which is uh, he's creating and used as a model for the entire creation, was himself. Why not then? And the whole creation is nothing other than a creation which stands as a model to a copy, and therefore the universe must in some respect be like himself. Oh, well that means then the supreme originating principle of the entire universe, the cosmos and all, is likeness. That's the supreme originating principle, likeness. So here, in the philosophical pursuit of trying to reach the nature of an ultimate reality, hey, it comes back. That's the principle. 
Well, then how do you become like the one? New quest. Now we have to be pretty sure what we mean by this one, if we are now being urged to be like it. Hmm. That's right. Whole new quest. And this is a rather interesting phase. And it's going to deal with this little statement we wrote over there. It says, look. Everyone is a one. Everything is a one. It may be then that if you are sufficiently this thing called the one, that it will be over and you'll gain exactly what it is or you won't. I always like that. You'll either get it or you won't. And that's what he does. He says, okay, look here. If you become like it, you gain it. If not, not. Now, what do you do if you don't gain it? And thank goodness he has a way of going. He says, all right, then, then you have to go back. You have to go back. You have to study the nature of the soul. See how it depends upon and derives from the intelligence and attains excellence by participation in reason. Study the differences in reason, that means intelligence, and our reason. Go back. Go back. He wants you to go back. He wants you to go back. To go back because of this, now we're on this major issue. Now let's see if I can make this clear. Um, this is the problem. You see, let me see if I can capture it this way. All right, here I go. All right, here I go. Now, if my goal is to gain an insight or to see this thing called the one, all right, If I am going to use that vision for some purpose, if it's going to allow me to, to function in some special way, If I can, if I conceive in any way, then it might serve some advantage to me. Now here's the most curious part of this. You'll get exactly what you're looking for to the degree that you're looking for it, but you won't get it. Do it again. In this game, you'll go just as far, you see, you'll go just as far as you want to go. You'll stop when it has fulfilled some purpose of yours or mine. If you want this to function for you in a special way of being, in any way whatsoever, then whenever you get that point, you'll stop because you will have reached your goal. If you think it's going to give you any advantage whatsoever in any dimension, whatever it is, in heaven or hell, <laughs> you'll stop when you think you've reached that point. That means then you have an idea of what you think the one is. 
you have an idea of what you think what it is and how you can proceed with it <laughs> and you'll get exactly you'll get exactly what you're looking for and uh, and uh, it will always be dissatisfying because you can't turn this, you can't turn this to any purpose, you can't turn it in any special way, you can't use it to your advantage in any way, because that very need, see that very need is going to function to trap you within, its, within that very limit. That's how you know you've gone far enough. So therefore there's a whole range of human experiences in playing the game of meditations and meditation contemplation. And so you'll get in various states and you'll say, oh, I reached it way back when or then or there or here or maybe later. You will already have a conception of it. That conception of it will limit it And unless you understand that, unless you understand if that goes on, you have to understand that. Otherwise, any pursuit into this realm will be very interesting at some times, but most often frustrating. Because we don't have a clear enough idea of what shapes our vision. And we fail to grasp how our expectations, even those that we hide from ourselves, limit that vision, shape it, narrow it, <coughs> circumscribe it. That means, you see, let me put it now in Plotinus' language, to whatever degree there is a difference between your idea of the one and it, to whatever degree there's a difference, to that degree, you ain't gonna get it. As the one does not contain any difference, it's always present to us, and we're always present to it. When, 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 when. When we no longer contain difference. It's the difference on our side that we have to deal with. That's why all the associations and all of the images that are attached to these things and from your own basic needs in early life, shape and contort and twist that vision. And uh, I want to go into the great section, what he calls the inspired dance in the chorus in a minute. All right. The one, therefore, all right. it's present to all those who can touch it, it's absent only to those who cannot. Because when the soul is impressed with something else, I could put another word in here, concerned for something else. When it's attentive to other things, when part of its attention is for other things, use function advantage then its own goal is less than the supreme therefore it's not going to be realizable when your own goal therefore is less than that of the pure idea of the one not going to get it. When its goal, when our goal, your goal, my goal, is to gain a function from it, use it, it's gone.
So I brought a great quote. I'd like to read it to you. Ah, huh, there it is. As the one does not contain any difference, it is always present as we are present to it when we, when we no longer contain difference. The one does not aspire to us to move around us, we aspire to it to move around it. Actually, we always move around it, but we don't always look. We are like a chorus grouped about a conductor who allow their attention to be distracted by the audience. If, however, they were to, re that they were to turn towards their conductor, they would sing as they should and would really be with him. We are always around the one. If we were not, we would dissolve and cease to exist. Yet our gaze does not remain fixed upon this one. When we look at it, we then attend, attain the end of our desires and find rest. Then it is that all discord past, then we dance an inspired dance around it. In this dance, the soul looks upon the source of life, the source of the intelligence, the origin of being and the cause of good, the root, the very root of the soul. For all of these emanate from the one, As we turn then towards the one, we exist to a higher degree, while to withdraw from it, that's a fall. Our soul is delivered by rising to that place where it's free of all evils, difficulties. There it knows, there it's immune, there it truly lives. Life not united with divinity is a shadow of authentic life. Thus, with all of these, the soul filled with divinity is pregnant, and this is its starting point, and this is its goal. Thought I'd like to read that too. All right, let's have a couple of questions, and let's push it a little further. Ah. About the difference between the one thing. Um, like you said with a pen, it could come into existence and then it could start to disintegrate. Do you have, do you have a, uh, pardon me, do you have a watch? Let's see what time it is. No, no, do you have a watch? No. May I have your watch? Oh, oh. Right. You need it. Yeah, thanks. Right. right. So, uh, would you agree I can uh, take this watch and pull it apart, mm -hmm. right? And then I'd have all the <laughs> parts here, wouldn't I? Right? And I could give, I'd give you back the whole watch. I'll give it all the, if I give all the parts, then she'll have the whole watch, won't she? She shouldn't complain, should she? I'm going to give her all the parts. And if you have all the parts, you have the whole watch, don't you? Right? No. What do you mean, no? You should say yes. There's some unity missing. No, no, no. <laughs> See, that was the, why I took it apart. That only was one unity. Now she can shake it in a bag, and she can have as many unities as she wants. Oh, no, there's a certain order um, within the unity that's required. You mean there's some unities that are more functional than others? Yes. Oh, okay. But I could get that by, and still keep out a couple of parts, couldn't I? Oh, yeah, I could take the, 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 the watch strap off. And, this part and that part, and just give her back the functioning unity. Then she'd have the whole watch, wouldn't she? Mm, no. What do you mean, no? Why don't you say yes? It wouldn't be a wristwatch anymore. You took the band off. But it would still function as a unity, wouldn't it? You don't need all the parts functionally, do you? Oh, by the way, would you want the unity as well as you want it to be set the way it was set before? So it functions for a certain purpose? Yes. 
Oh. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, it's only one watch, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And being a watch that's not any different than anyone else's watch, they're, then they have two of them. There'd be two watches, both as one. Agree? If, did you have a watch? No. Have one? Don't you carry a watch? <laughs> Miss? She may, not, she may not let me have it. <laughs> but if I had it, would you agree we would have two watches? Each is one. Mm -hmm. Am I talking about its unity now? When I call it each a one? They both have unity. They both have it, but am I referring to its unity when I talk about each being a one? No. no. Its, uni its unity, therefore, are the way in which the parts are related and ordered together to serve a function. It's, it being one, we are just considering it in its totality, aren't we? And ignoring everything else. Is that right? Or would you, look, if not, would you agree? If you have one watch that has a greater unity than another, would you say you have two watches or, or different unities? But you wouldn't say they're both watches. Yeah, I would. Oh, then you're ignoring their differences in unities. Yeah. Therefore, when you're ignoring their difference in unities, you can speak of it as a one, can't you? And you're ignoring everything else. So therefore, there's a difference between one and unity. Right? Mm -hmm. And would you agree that unity, the way in which it functions, is to serve, it's, it's really, would you not agree, <laughs> The maker of the watch has a model in his mind. That's the model. He then produces the watch. The watch is the copy or the image. And we can make other watches, can we not? Right? From this one model, we can make a whole bunch of these as copies. But this is the primary model, is it not? From which all of these were generated. Then might we not say, this model is the one of which all of these are copies. Then this one is capable in some way of being <coughs> a cause or a gener generative source Right, this can be a generative source of these. It puts them into production. They are dependent upon it. Right. Their degree to which they are like this, to the degree to which they are like that, depends upon their utility and their perfection. Mm -hmm. Agree? The more perfect is like the model, the more perfect the watch would be to that degree. The differences between, between the different copies could then be judged in respect to always the one. Ah. These may come and pass out of existence and others may reappear. Therefore, whatever it passes out of existence and is destroyed, it doesn't affect the model. The model, so long as it's a model and capable of like, functioning in this way, is productive of these on and on and on. So do you think there's a model to life? <coughs> think there's a model to existence? Does it stand in the same relationship as this example we used? What would it be like knowing that directly? rather than running around and seeing copies all the time. Because this universe is a copy of the model of the mind of God, isn't it? Hey, what would it be like to getting a glimpse of that? Mm -hmm. Right? As the great Chinese poet once said, that'd be hot stuff. <laughs> right? Well, he said it in Chinese, you know. Right? right? It'd be magnificent, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be magnificent? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you see, it's all obvious. The 
Isn't that nice? And you see it all the play, right? Wherever you, right? From now on, you're ruined. Right? You're going to see the one wherever you look, aren't you? Right? Wherever you look, what are you going to see? One. But you don't see it, too. You infer it. And you might ask, then, what's the source of all the ones? Is that crazy? I mean, is, could there possibly be a source of one? I mean, one is just a number. No, one is not a number. All the numbers are measures of one. One is the measure of number. Just like that's a model, that's a measure of all the copies. And here's where we go in our culture. You see, our culture wants to say that as you proceed away from sense experience, this is our culture speaking now, right? As you proceed away from sense experience, It gets more and more theoretical, and another word for it is abstract. What that means is that you strip away from it its vitality and its life. Right, and therefore it is less real. Less real. And this is our teaching. This comes from uh, English philosophers and people like that. The Greek world is it's the same thing except for one difference. It goes the other way around. They switch them around. That's all. Same thing. Just switch them around. This has the higher vitality, source of life, meaning. This, the copies, more sterile. Interesting, though, but still, as you proceed further up and up, the more profound, the more interesting, the more exciting, the more meaningful life is. Right? David Hume and Locke and all of these other people, they want to argue this way because they are in defense of something called a strange beast called common sense. And we're going to talk about that one day because the, uh, the crowning of common sense and perpetuating the idea that the highest expression of the human mind is to produce common sense theories, common sense views, is, uh, is what is what finally comes down to be reducing everything to its bottom line. <laughs> it is, same thing. <laughs> See, there isn't any meaning in life. That's yeah. yeah, reductionism. That's reductionism. Yeah, reductionism. Yeah. 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 So, what is our real task then? See, there are two tasks. One is, the contemplative side should be, all right, you should become more interested in yourself. That naturally brings about a contemplative activity. You have to find out about yourself. And you have to, be, you have to look at this in its purest possible way. For any time you think it can serve any of these, you slipped into limitation. And I have a friend who I recently talked to, who's a master of more than, he's a master of four or five religions, having lived them, Christianity, worked his way up in the system, Islamic thought, Buddhism, Shivism, I mean, he worked, in, all worked on, through all of these systems. There's only one tragic flaw, you see. He wanted to use it inwardly for a certain purpose. And if it didn't meet that purpose, he became disenfranchised with it. If it didn't allow him to function in a certain way, it no longer engaged him seriously. And therefore, he didn't see any advantage to each of them, even though he worked very well and was a master of each of these. And so he moved from one to the other. You see, he's somehow going to have to come back and say to himself that this need to turn it, to turn it, to have it serve us. See, that's what he wants. He wants the highest to serve him. Good luck. <coughs> right? Good luck. We'd say, hey, good luck. If you can do it, let us know. But it may be uh, you're going to be nothing but tears and disaster in your life. And so, uh, to put a happy ending to the story, he is beginning to turn around and say, well, maybe I do have a problem. And most interesting, you know what the problem, one of the problems turns out to be, is that behind it all he has this great fear of death. 
Now, he doesn't have a fear of death, of course. What he does have is he has a fearful idea of death. Right? You can't have a fear of death. It's impossible to have a fear of death unless you're extremely wise. Why? Because you'd have to know what it is. Right? You have to drop dead, experience it, come back and say, hey, I know all about death. Experienced it. Pretty fearful, let me tell you that. Right? Agree? Yeah. Take a weekend there, come back and say, hey, you know what? I've been there. I'm, you, I'm glad I left it. But you see, he has a terrible fear. And the terrible fear is a certain fear of an idea of death, which is why he wants all of these things to overcome it. Rather than discover the roots of why he believes this fearsome idea of death. And if he can get rid of that, then he won't need it to serve, and therefore he may be then free to pursue his philosophical journey. This side of turning to look at what holds us back or restricts our adventure, our spiritual adventure, of course, goes by the Platonic name of philosophical midwifery. Now, you see, he's pregnant with an idea. He has an idea in his mind. Right? He has an idea. In his, didn't know it was there, by the way. Right? And what he needs is to have the root of that idea come out, pull it out, because he's pregnant with it. He needs someone to help him deliver him of that idea. That is so that it can then be visible, so he can then see it, and then he can judge it, and he can see its origin and how he came to believe it, right? And how he came to believe it. This last step is the most central one. That's the most central one. Because when you get the origin, you get the conditions. When you get the conditions for the belief, then you have to discover how we came, he came to believe it. And once he recognizes that those conditions no longer are significant, uh, he can drop the belief and he's free of that. That no longer is an inhibiting idea towards his own progress. What's that called? Philosophical memory. Socrates calls himself a philosophical midwife because that was his art. That's what he did. He waited and he saw people that were pregnant, not with babies, right, but pregnant with ideas. And he knew exactly when it was a good time to deliver of them or to bring them on early or to abort them. All the language of midwifery is in philosophical side as an analogy to it. And therefore, in this whole pursuit, as I stated it here, what is needed is a twofold training. One is a natural contemplation of the divine, and the other is to being attentive to these insidious ideas. Why are they insidious? Because we're not aware of what shapes our vision. That's the problem. We have to find out what distorts it and shapes it. So, thank you. If there's any more questions, I'll have some fun with some questions. Thank you for coming. Enjoyed it. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.